Hello, I'm Phil Dobby, and today on the Debunking Economics podcast, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has decided he wants to do something about housing affordability, and in his budget this week, he's decided to do exactly the wrong thing. So today, we look at why getting rid of stamp duty will have precisely the wrong effect, and what should Philip Hammond do to fix housing affordability. Well, if you're buying a house in Britain for the first time, one that costs less than half a million pounds, well, your stamp duty will no longer be charged on £300,000 of that cost. Now, bearing in mind that stamp duty doesn't apply for the first 125000 anyway, it means your maximum supposed saving is £5,000. That's a 1% saving on the cost of your half a million pound home. So even if that was to work and that saving didn't mean house prices rise to soak up all of that money, so the money actually goes from being revenue for the government to revenue for the seller of the home, even if that wasn't the case, and it just made lots of homes 1% cheaper, is it really going to make much of a difference? After all, the average house price in the UK is now £223,000, an almost 5% increase over the last year. So there we are, that's that 1% saving wiped out straight away. And £482,000 is the average price for London. But there again, Steve, being devil's advocate for the moment, uh, London house prices are falling. So does that actually show that maybe the market is working, that London has peaked and people are now buying cheaper houses elsewhere? Yeah, I know. London house prices are falling falling to some extent, that's true. Um, And it's partly because of a combination of things. It's too expensive to live there and too expensive to commute there. Something has to give, and they're not going to drop the rail prices. So, um, in that case, I think uh, the, the the only buying really that's going on, and this is not the only buying, but a major part of the buying is foreign buying, and that's now becoming uh, targeted to some extent. We may actually see some government policy in that, like the ones that the uh, Canadians have brought in, but um, it's still I mean, massively more expensive than it was. And I'm looking at a, a nominal index here, so I, I won't go too far back in the nominal index. But if you go back to 2000, the nominal uh, house index in, for using the Bank of International Settlements data, which sets the index at 100 in 2010, it was 50 in 2000. So that's doubling the nominal value over the uh, to 2010. And now across the entire country, it's 130. And that uh, house prices fell after when the crisis hit they fell from a, a peak uh, index value in 2008 of 110. Uh, they fell down to 90, so it's you know something in the order of a 20% fall. But since that, that's when QE began. And QE, I think, has been a large reason why we've got uh, house prices have continued rising. People who've made share market gains by uh, selling shares to companies that had to buy shares because the government bought bonds off them, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> that's now... Help house prices rise to the stage where they're, you know, thirty percent, forty percent higher than they were at the end of the um, end of the downturn. Um, but what's also happening, and I, this is where I expect domestic buying to run out at some stage. Uh, household debt in the UK peaked at about ninety six percent of GDP back in two thousand and ten. It fell to eighty five percent. It's now rising. It's about eighty seven percent. Not rising by much. But that's adding some extra potential demand impetus. Probably not in the UK, in London itself because of the you know, peculiar issues of London, house prices being three times the rest of the country and the cost of commuting there being impossible as well. Something has to give in that market. But uh, the rest of the UK could start seeing its house prices rising a bit, I think, courtesy of this extra demand pressure coming in now. Though it can't go particularly far because, again, with just a rise of... Uh, a bit over 10% of GDP, you're back at levels that are literally the highest England's ever had. But how can they? I mean, apart from, you know, and you hinted at it, the fact that, you know, there's foreign buyers, how can houses, like anything, get above a price that people are prepared to pay for them? I mean, surely that they reach a point where people go, well, I can't afford this anymore, I'm not going to buy it. I mean, obviously, we've, got, yeah. we've had low interest rates for a while, so people have a, a false idea of how much they can afford. But I mean, surely the market's going to determine if you can't afford to buy it, you're not going to buy it, therefore, the price is going to come down. Well, it's a positive feedback, because if you don't, don't just buy houses to live in, unfortunately, you buy them also to gamble on. And therefore, if house prices are rising, that actually adds to demand. If, if you have rising price of carrots, that doesn't add to the demand for carrots. So assets are very, very different. People buy because they see the prices rising. And there's a positive feedback between the two. And that's why it's dangerous. That's why it needs to be controlled. Uh, but in the, the, that, the, and that can go on 
and it has gone on. It's just driven, you know, UK uh, household debt levels has trebled them uh, in the last 30 years. But, of course, when you get to this high level, what actually keeps house prices rising isn't the level of debt. It's partially the rate of change of debt, but it's also the rate of change of the rate of change of debt. And this is why it gets, where it gets very tricky. Uh, but the basic logic, uh, and I've done the, the mathematics on this and also some of the empirical work for the United States with uh, uh, two colleagues, Paul Amarund and, uh, and Ricard. Um, if you think about what, what is the demand for housing, fundamentally, when, when we're talking domestic purchases, it's the flow of new mortgages. So that's the rate of change of mortgage debt is the flow of new mortgages divided by the price level. And that's going to be roughly equal to the flow of supply in the market, which is the which is houses being turned over for all sorts of reasons, from divorce to people trying to capitalise on gains to people moving, uh, plus the rate of change of, of housing stock that's being added, you know, houses being demolished and new ones being added. So you've got a relationship between the change in mortgage debt and the level of house prices. So your main driver is therefore the change in the change in housing debt, which is the change in new mortgages and the, and the rate of change of house prices. And the UK's case, uh, using data going back to 1970, according to economic theory, I should find a correlation of zero. It's conventional economic theory. The data gives me a correlation of 0.56. Um, so if you want to slow down, if you want to reduce house prices, the main thing you've got to do is reduce the rate of growth of mortgage yeah, debt. It sounds like it's spiralling out of control, however bad it is now. It's getting worse all the time. But I mean, if you try and do anything about it, um, I, I mean, th- that is going to hurt the economy. Yeah, it does, and this is this is the catch twenty two. I mean, I, I often think about we should make make we should do this analogy one day. But uh, it reminds me of the episode, the very first episode of Alien. You'll see the the, you know, mm. the, the classic Signore Weaver uh, first issue of Alien when they try to take that thing off John Hurt's face, and they you know t- tentatively the, the, the creatures over his face for those that haven't seen the movie, um, and and they and they try to use a pair of pliers, I think, to break one of the limbs. It breaks one of the limbs, the blood in the animal falls out and goes straight through three or four levels of the hull of the ship. And somebody then says, interesting defence mechanism, you don't dare kill it. <laughs> well, that's, that's fundamentally the housing market because when you have the extent to which people have speculated on it and their apparent net worth is based on inflated house prices versus the level of debt, they've purchased to buy them. If house prices start to fall, there's panic everywhere. Not everywhere, panic amongst those who bought the houses. And uh, and then when the, cause when, the, when the slowdown in the, in the rate of growth of uh, new mortgages occurs, there's a slowdown in the rate of growth of the money supply as well and GDP falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, when I was watching that movie, I was thinking that it's just like the housing market. That I remember, Absolutely. Remember, I, I too, remember yeah. commenting to when the person. I was like about 20, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Look, so what about affordable housing then? We've got uh, uh, Sajid Javid, who's the, uh, the the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. He's the guy responsible, supposedly, for making sure people can afford to buy houses. His mm. answer is that people can't afford houses because young people are spending too much on nights out and smashed avocado at breakfast. <laughs> uh, they're not I'm facing... He hasn't been thrown... He'd been hit by avocados when he walks down the street. <laughs> well, he says not. they're not young people, not facing up to the reality of modern daily life. They have no understanding of the modern market, he says, something they have in common with him. He has uh, no one to say exactly. He has <laughs> by the, the sounds I mean, of it. The, le- the level of, of say, I mean, when you're looking at mortgages, if you've got half a million pounds, then to actually purchase one of those places, you've got to be saving at least, you know, if you're looking at uh, 10%, these days, 10% deposit. Um the amount of time people take to save effectively what is two years income for many young people uh, is they're not young people anymore what they can afford to buy. No. At a particular point, this is this is partly your question, can this go on forever? Uh, what I would like to use as a way of an, an analysing this is effectively an epidemiologi- ep- epidemiological model. That's a hard one to say on a Sunday morning um, because when you look at how a disease spreads, and that's also a good analogy to the housing house prices, uh, then you have a population of non-infected, a population of infected, and a population of recovered. And in this case, the, the infected are those people who have already bought a house, the non-infected are the ones who haven't yet bought a house, and the recovered are ones who have sold a house. Now, if you start off with, you know, like say, you used to begin with, say, with zero, zero percent home ownership, then when somebody buys a house, uh, let's say you to a population of 100, then you now have 99% available infected and 1% infected. 
And if you keep on going 10, 20, 30, 40, 50%, uh, ultimately you get to the point where the, you, the number of people who can be infected and add to the, the, those with the disease already is less than half the population. So that, that epidemiological logic means that you start running out of people who can afford to get into the get get into the, the, the disease the market mm. and i think that's partly what would actually stop this happening where the not the government's getting caught up in policy on the other side the government particularly australian governments the classic instance of course they start seeing house prices the be all and end all and they do everything they can to keep the prices going well i mean that, and the, of course it, it becomes a contentious issue and certainly you know the, the reason why i wanted to talk about this is because it's becoming a, a contentious issue now and so uh, the treasurer philip hammond and sajid javid are saying well we have to find policy answers to all of this but Ooh. but how how big is the issue so i look at um I mean, th- there's one thing, people can't afford to buy a house, which, uh, m- you know, maybe they need to rent, and we can look at that in a second. But the the other thing is, you know, well, what if you just can't afford to pay and then your house gets repossessed? House repossessions are pretty close to a, an all-time low in the UK at the moment. They're well below 2,000 a quarter. They did get up to 12,000 a quarter in 2009. Uh, but even then, you know, that that's a very small proportion of the total population defaulting on their mortgages and getting their houses repossessed. So is that a big issue or is the bigger issue just the fact that people can't afford to buy houses? Well, there's going to be it's becoming a political issue because certainly when, when I'm speaking out of young uh, young groups, group of young people around the country, uh, that is becoming more and more something they're actually quite politically pissed off by. And they will ultimately become more than half the population because I'm not sure the average age with which house prices, house purchases occur now, but it certainly isn't in your twenties anymore. Mm. So you're getting uh, you're getting everybody over eighteen uh, up to a certain age group. You're, gonna, you're then talking half the voting population. Once you get anywhere near that, then you get a political possibility that rather than having political parties seeing their role as keeping house prices rising, it may be political capital in saying we're going to get them down and actually mean it. Right, but you know what? Though it is those you know young people eating their smashed avocados, and also yeah. the the expectation that they're going to have a house with uh, with an indoor toilet. You know, if it was good enough for us to have a uh, an outdoor dunny at the end of the garden, uh, you know, they've they've just got to get realistic expectations, haven't they? That's partly it, uh, but it's also when I mean, you have a rise in the level of, of urban agglomerations like London. I mean, again, if you go back thirty years, I'm not sure what London's population was then, but these days it's supposed to be fourteen million. Um, the scale of the agglomeration and the transport system also becomes an issue. So if you have people living on the periphery of London who are told, you know, uh, and, and who work in this, work in anywhere near the centre, uh, then they face massive transportation costs as well. Mm. They start looking at it and thinking, I'm either, uh, if I buy out here, I can't afford to commute in. And I think in, in that particular case, London's got a very peculiar problem because it's got, I, I would imagine, I'm not sure, but I imagine one of the most expensive public transportation systems in the world. And at that level, uh, it becomes catch-22. You can't afford to rent, you can't afford to buy, and you can't afford to work in London, so you might as well eat smashed avocados. <laughs> exactly, yeah, on the dole. The, right. um, but what, uh, just once a week, because that's all you could afford probably. But, I mean, in, in that scenario, wouldn't those wouldn't companies say, well, okay, we can't afford to, uh, to operate in these circumstances because the workforce are demanding so much money to cover all of these costs, we should move out of London. And, and you know, that's what the, the whole Thames Corridor, that's how, you know, around Reading, places like that started to see industry growing up. We're not yeah, seeing that. We're not seeing that so much in Australia because there's no transport infrastructure out of the out of the big cities, and all, all the secondary cities strangely are allowed to uh, uh, to basically die. Um, but here, um, you know, there is that opportunity for regional development. I think that's possible, and um, but of course, it's a it's a pretty clumsy way to deal with expensive housing. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's that's certainly feasible because, and I look at the cost of just even a simple you know urban journey in London. 20 kilometres will cost you seven quid uh, one way. It's it's just crazy expensive compared to income. So uh, if the people can't afford to travel, then the companies are going to have to do it. And that's, again, as I said, a pretty crazy way to cope with expensive housing. Well, the other way, uh, according to the Chancellor and also Sajid Javid has said the same thing as well. In fact, I think it's fairly... 
accepted wisdom, but you're going to tell me, no doubt, that that's wrong. It increased supply. Uh, Sajid Javid said we need 300,000 additional homes uh, in England each year, which is twice what it was a couple of years ago. It was uh, about 215,000 last year. So is that the answer to affordable housing? Uh, just build more? And, and if that is the case... Why isn't that just happening anyway? Why aren't market forces making it happen? No, uh, for several reasons. One is because the, the dynamics are, are quite complicated because if you look at the supply of the flow of supply for housing, as I said, it's turnover of existing properties plus new ones being built. And that's that itself is related to the house price level. Mm. When you take a look at the change in house prices, then it's the change in the number of houses coming onto the market and the acceleration of house building. So it's it's the second order effect. The acceleration changes much more rapidly than the rate of than the rate of a change. So if you're, if you're driving a car, uh, you know the acceleration forces are the ones you, the, the, you if you hit the brake and hit the accelerator and you're at a, you know in the medium range for the car, that's when you feel the forces forwards and backwards. Same sort of story for acceleration here. So house prices could plunge if the acceleration got too high, and that in that situation. Um, it, it, it's just, it is not a decent control mechanism. And it's one of the reasons I think politicians talk about it is they know they can they can talk about it, wring their hands and walk away and ignore the issue later. Right. So, so if I'm hearing you right. What you're saying is if he's saying, well, we're going to keep house prices or make house prices affordable because we're going to buy, build 300,000 additional homes this year, then to keep them low, he's going to have to build 400,000 the year after and 500, 550,000 the year after that and then 750 the year after that and a million the year after that. Otherwise, the, the moment he slows down then the house price is going to start creeping up again yeah. but it's right. also the price it's really the price of land i mean there's there's a mm. couple of issues here which are re, which are real issues and it's one of the few things i like in ricardo is the argument about what causes the pro, rent rents to be the level they are and it also relates to land prices as well so as you develop a country build a city like london um a lot of the increase in prices just due to the fact that it's becoming more, more dense in population. And anybody who's bought early does very nicely because the price rises as the population rises. That's a, a classic Ricardian effect. Um, you've got to get out of that. The only way you can get out of that is by taxing the increase in the value of the land. But that's, you know, that's about as popular as polio. So um, it's rather a hard one to implement. But, of course, what's, what's the, the new line called the Queen Elizabeth line being built across London right now? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the east-west link. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's going to drastically increase the value of properties along that line. Did the people who uh, who are benefiting from that actually do anything themselves to increase the value of their properties? Not no. no this this basically siphoning off the increased um, property value. So the argument about land taxes say well, we're going to tax the increase in the value of the land uh, caused by activities which have got nothing to do with what the, the local owner has done. Now, if you bring that in, um, it's it's the sort of thing that the Henry George crowd have been on about for a long long time that is a way to stop that house price rises happening because of course if you've got to pay a capital gains tax on a property then you've got to finance it out of your income and suddenly it's not so easy to cover that mortgage anymore so you would have a a fairly high likelihood of of dropping the level of house prices by doing that now again i think that's got zero chance of being implemented in the current political environment well that raises another question you know whether whether it's because the new rail line's been built or you know there's new facilities paid for by the by the local council um people do do their sums don't they to find out what the maximum they can afford is if uh, if council rates are high then people can afford less and so perhaps that means property prices will fall it means you know money is that the, the developers were going to get now goes to the councils in which case would councils <laughs> charging more actually help contain house prices it doesn't make anybody better off it just means the money shifts hands as to who the beneficiary is yeah and it has to be based on the value of the land rather than how many bedrooms you have which is the crazy situation you and i both know applies in the uk well Let's look at another factor that uh, that influences demand, and you you mentioned it yourself, foreign buyers. And uh, if we look at Kensington and Chelsea, the borough where the Grenfell Tower took place, there are said to be over 1,600 empty properties just in that one London borough, and they are predominantly uh, property speculators from 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 overseas. I know it's 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 obscene. One of my colleagues, Rex McKenzie, is starting to do work on that. Uh, and basically arguing there's a, there's a causal link. If you have councils that are so cash strapped because the, the, there's so many empty properties, and I think I think they 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 charge people one and a half times the council tax rate for having a property empty. Make it ten, mm. uh, but if one and a half times, that's why you decide to save six thousand quid by cladding Glenfell in fi- inflammable material. Yeah, I don't. Uh, by the way, I don't think Kensington and Chelsea are short of money. 
I mean, no, they, they may have. The, they may, the, the, I think they're one of the wealthiest councils in the country, if not the wealthiest. Yeah, but they spent they spent it doing beautification, making the outside of poor buildings look good for the rich people. They don't make mm. the, they don't build more more buildings themselves. Yeah. So it, it is. It's quite appalling how these two things are interlinked. And if you actually, I mean, because we've allowed households households to turn into speculative assets rather than places to live, uh, and people then buy them and leave them literally empty for the sheer pleasure of seeing the house price rise over time. Um, that you know, if, if, if even if they can even not maintain the buildings, which of course happens on occasions, it's an appalling way to manage a country. So, do you then, for therefore, uh, try and limit demand? Do you say, well, you know, if you buy a house, you've got to live in it. If uh, if you if you're a, a, a foreign buyer, uh, you've got to live in this country. Um, do you do you try and limit uh, the the demand for housing in that way? There, there, there are some arguments for you know foreign buying of properties. Uh, because you do have, you know, executives who fly between countries. You do have people who buy a holiday house somewhere and actually use it as such, et cetera, et cetera. So you do need to allow some for some uh, sensible level of that. But I think the French had a rule at one stage where no more than 10% of the housing stock could be sold to foreign buyers. Yeah. And, uh, and something of that order, and you talk more than 10% of your housing, people who don't live there, um, that you know, you're clearly getting extreme if it's getting beyond that. In places like Chelsea, I think it's something in the order of 30%. Mm. Yeah, well, Australia used to do it too. I, I, I think uh, uh, for new properties. Well, I mean, and I mean that is it, it's interesting. People have uh, noticed on social media. People have been saying, uh, you know, what a great job New Zealand's done in stopping foreign buyers. But actually, uh, in, uh, in the um, in, in the last budget, but all they've done actually is what Australia's done. Foreign buyers can't buy new properties. They can just uh, they uh, can buy new properties. Sorry, they can't buy established dwellings. Mm. But all of these measures, if we're limiting foreign buyers, we're limiting the potential universe for buying property is that going to hold prices or keep or keep them down or is it not having or, or is it overplayed is it really not having that I, much I think impact? the main one to look at there is vancouver and apparently when they put a substantial tax on on foreign purchases of properties that's what took the wind out of the vancouver house price bubble no. which is cool it's still substantial uh, but uh, that does seem to have an impact and of course the other thing is you know, what you're beholden to what's happening in political policy in the country in which the foreigners are coming. So, you know, if you had anything happening with the Russian oligarchs uh, and, they, and they suddenly felt help uh, safer in Russia and stopped buying these properties, uh, or if China cracks down properly on foreign uh, money transfers because they're worried about their, their uh, accumulated foreign reserves, uh, then suddenly the buying pressure disappears. So it, it becomes something where you're worried, you're not, you're worried about the house price level you're not worried about the house as a as a place for people to live and we, we have to get back to the stage we treat it as a consumption item not an investment item so what about the provision of council housing where you know you say well okay there's a lot of people who can't afford rent or can't certainly can't afford to buy the council is going to provide they're going to give them at their housing at a, a at a knockdown rent um does that have any impact on the rest of the housing market yeah, surely at some point people, yeah, pe- people are going to say well yeah i mean it's if, yeah. if it's so cheap to do that how can we charge more to to rent out for our house yeah and, and that's that's one of the i think major mistakes the uk made under maggie thatcher was to abolish that system and reduce the number of council flats because this is let's talk about that well-known socialist country singapore <laughs> uh, which has a huge amount of council provision, of public provision of housing. And uh, from what I've seen, hasn't quite had the same house price bubble the rest of the world has had, even though the housing there is expensive. It's more, it's closer to incomes. So uh, it's quite possible to make a, a social decision about the provision of, of property. And one thing I actually want, I'm curious about, what would the impact of this? Most of the house price level is actually the price of the land you're buying it on. Nonetheless, there's a construction factor there. Mm. And there's also the speed of construction is an issue. It's very supply just very slowly. But 3D printing of housing looks like it's going to take off in the next 10 years. And what would happen if you could build a, a block of you know, council flats uh, at one flat per day? Uh, with, with a, at a cost of about ten to twenty thousand quid to build the entire thing, uh, if that starts happening, I think we could see some really interesting dynamics on this market, which I would thoroughly enjoy seeing. Well, I mean, when you talk about it being related to the value of the land, I mean, the la- value of the land obviously is exactly the same as that. You know, the house and the land together. It's whatever the demand is at that time. So, yeah. if the council builds a lot of council houses, and say a quarter of a town is now council houses, the other three quarters, whether irrespective of the you know, the land value, is going to be held back as much as the the, the whole you know house and land together uh because people are paying less rent because they you know a quarter of the population is in council housing 
Yeah, and it, it, it takes the sting out of the market as a speculative issue, and that's what we need. Right. So better doing that than the idea, as Sajid Javid's idea, that we just need more and more houses built. And I guess the other, the, the other thing as well, is, you know, or the, you know, and we've spoken about this many times in the past, the idea that, uh, no, we'll help people get on the housing market with the first home buyers grant, which you've called the first home vendors grant, because it basically just pushes prices up. And now we've got this uh, this crazy idea from the, from the Chancellor about abolishing get stamp duty. Well, that's actually a point you made a moment ago about tax and council tax. If you do that, it'll go into the house price. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to do that. So the other thing that went wrong with council houses was the idea of selling them because <laughs> sort of negate. I mean, first, I mean, people complain about the fact that they were sold and never replaced. But isn't part of the problem the idea that they're sold in the first place? Because then people exactly. would be... Exactly. Exactly. Because this is, a, this is one of Maggie Thatcher's reforms that I think the UK will look back and rue ba- very badly because that's what enabled the, the, the growth of the private debt to take off because... That when I look at the data, and 1982 is the, is the crucial date when house when private debt, which had never exceeded 73 percent of GDP in the UK, went from 55 percent uh, over Maggie Thatcher and and and, um, and um, Tony Blair's reign from 55 percent to 195 percent of GDP, and it was apparently a large institutional factor was Maggie uh, deregulating the finance for housing so that rather than building societies providing it and building society then does not create money and therefore doesn't add to you know, asset price levels uh deregulated led the commercial banks in there and that's when the house price bubble really started mm. so the other idea of you know local councils try is housing commission schemes i guess they don't work either the idea where you know you buy part of a house the local authority buys the rest um, you each benefit if prices go up, then, you know, the, you're buying that again for... for it's it's for, actually helping inflate the bubble. Yeah, exactly. So the only answer, but it seems like a sensible answer, and it would certainly be not the approach that's taken by this government, is that, um, uh, you, you know, if, you, if you're looking at housing affordability, it's just look at, look at the idea of holding prices by making sure a reasonable proportion of the total housing stock are council houses, don't you know people who are moving into those houses just having to accept the fact that you know you're probably never going to own a house in your life but do you need one if you can't afford to buy stay in this council house treat it as though it's your own because you're going to have it for life probably and that's the situation in germany again and this is where germany one of the few lessons germany has the rest of the world can learn from Uh, i've been told by colleagues recently there is a house price bubble developing in germany now which isn't amazing because the banks are totally re-regulated but uh, German rental situation is that once you, once you rent somewhere, it's pretty much your property. Yeah. Uh, until you, and you, you can't be kicked out. You, the house can't be flipped on you. And in the, in the house contract, you're expected to provide the kitchen. Yeah. I don't need so not the not the knives and forks. I mean the whole day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down. Getting it Good. fitted. Absolutely. Yeah. So but, there we are. So that that is a house for life. So I mean, if you, and if you're in a council house, um, Same and thing. and you and you're thinking, well, I, w- I do want to buy, and you do get to a circumstance where you can buy. Well, hopefully, the fact that there's just so many council houses has uh, brought down the private market as well. So perhaps there'll be more chance to do that. Yeah, but I also think we need to do to change the regulations on lending to stop to just look at the current ceiling ratio of. Of, uh, house pri- of house loans to house prices. And that, like in the UK, that might be running at something like 20 to, 20 to 1 in terms of a, a ratio of the income of the house earns to the, <coughs> to the, to the, uh, the rental income in the house got to the, to the price. The price could be 10, 20 times the current rent. Set that as a max, what are the, leave it at the maximum now and reduce that by, by a factor of one every year. So you get back to the stage where ultimately, the maximum you can borrow to buy a property is 10 times as rental income, not 20. And in that uh, situation, I think we'd see house prices falling, which would be, you know, politically, you, you have to prepare <laughs> the country for that sort of thing because we're so locked into believing house prices should rise and always do rise that when they start reversing, the um, the stampede out of an inflating asset could be pretty dangerous. Yeah. So it is. I mean, politically, it's very difficult, isn't it? We're going to push up uh, government spending because we're going to buy all these houses, you know, build all these houses uh, for low rent. And uh, in doing that, we're going to devalue the your your property values. Uh, yeah. And we want to win the election. <laughs> the best thing about going are the smashed avocado eaters. <laughs> Let's uh, go after them. All right. Very good. OK. Excellent. Another problem solved. Uh, all we need to do now is implement it as policy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> good to talk again, Steve.
I can add. So the real answers, you know, controls on bank lending and more social housing, measures that are going to actually drive the prices down, cost money, and they are politically untenable, aren't they? Because people with houses don't want to see their prices go down. But how do you have affordable housing without that happening? And on social housing, which was not a feature of the budget, what about this? The number of council houses built in 2010 when the Tories came to power, the number built in that year was 36,700. The number built last year? 1,102. It doesn't seem that they see this as being part of the uh, answer. But if cheaper housing is available for people who need it, obviously it makes it hard to speculate on private property that costs many times more. So there's your obvious answer. And of course, bank lending constraints, as, as Steve was saying. And that's it for this edition. Don't forget, if you want to hear more, subscribe at debunkingeconomics.com or become a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon at patreon.com prof Steve Keen. Now, next time we saw Britain's growth forecast downgraded in the budget. Why? Because productivity is stagnating. How do we fix that problem? That's next time on the Debunking Economics podcast with Professor Steve Keen. I'm Phil Dobby. I'll see you then.